the history of open source uh, reaches all the way back to 70s. Um, it starts with uh, first massively commercially successful computer, which was PDP-11. Some universities uh, use this computer and they use it different ways. Uh, on the Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology, uh, they developed their own operating system and our tooling uh, that they used on this machine. And because of that, uh, a culture of sharing code uh, emerged uh, where people uh, would uh, 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 ask others for the source of uh, their tools that they uh, found interesting or useful and would adopt them for their own use cases. But it didn't last for long because uh, the next computer they acquired uh, was a, a different architecture and it wouldn't run uh, this uh, homebrew operating system. And they acquired a commercial Unix license uh, to run Unix on this new computer. Uh, this had some problems. Uh, some were more ideological, like uh, you had to sign an NDA to even run the Unix. And some were more practical, uh, like uh, uh, some of the components of the uh, uh, for some of the components of the commercial Unix, you didn't get source code even under the NDA. NDA. So you couldn't fix even trivial problems with uh, these components. And one of the people who uh, worked on M uh, at MIT at this time was Richard Stallman, uh, who founded uh, uh, Free Software Foundation uh, because he observed this uh, stark contrast between uh, the uh, sharing culture that existed before uh, the uh, uh, before the commercial Unix and uh, the problems that came with uh, the commercial software. Uh, uh, the uh, Free Software F Foundation uh, uh, supported development of uh, uh, free tools, and here the the uh, the term free is not uh, exactly uh, well chosen. Uh, some uh, argue that, uh, and uh, I think even Richard Stallman in retrospect sees that it's uh, not great because uh, uh, free may be, uh, because when uh, you say free software, uh, uh, you need to all, uh, add something like it's free as in freedom and not uh, free as in free beer. And uh, it could be that uh, uh, they could probably choose a better a better word for it. Uh, so uh, uh, the free uh, free software foundation would uh, develop uh, uh, free uh, free tools, but they still needed uh, the commercial Unix to run them. Uh, among these tools, there was Emacs, which I think was originally developed for the home home view, uh, homebrew system uh, that existed uh, before the, they used Unix, uh, but then uh, was ported to Unix as well. And uh, the GCC compiler, which uh, is the base of uh, making uh, the software uh, without the need to have Unix. And uh, later, uh, independent projects uh, adopted this uh, free license. One of the major one is li the Linux kernel. And together with uh, these uh, uh, tools provided uh, by the Free Software Foundation, uh, you could get uh, a complete operating system distribution uh, under free license that, uh, 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 that uh, you could use uh, uh, without any commercial software. Uh, the freedom that uh, uh, that uh, uh, Free Software Foundation envisions is that every user of the software has the ability uh, to modify the software, fix problems, uh, and share um, the changes they made to the software with other users. On the other hand, uh, uh, on Berkeley University, uh, they acquired uh, Unix from the start, 
uh, they didn't have their own system, but they needed uh, uh, tools uh, that weren't provided uh, with the commercial system and developed their, uh, their own. Initially, it, it was a collection of tools uh, that uh, was built uh, on top of the system, but eventually they started uh, to extend uh, the kernel and uh, over time, uh, the Berkeley system distribution replaced all parts uh, of uh, the original Unix and became an independent uh, uh, system distribution. Uh, interestingly, uh, the X server, uh, which is uh, released under a similar, uh, similar license as the Berkeley system distribution, uh, was uh, developed by, uh, at MIT. And the reason is that uh, uh, both, uh, both BSD and the X server are meant uh, to be used together with the uh, commercial uh, Unix. And uh, to be able to do that, uh, you need a software license that uh, allows you also to restrict uh, the users uh, by things like NDA, because uh, if the uh, if the uh, uh, if parts of the Berkeley system dis uh, distribution were uh, kernel extension uh, for uh, for the commercial Unix, they needed to be uh, then the, uh, available under the commercial license to be usable. And with GPL, which uh, uh, requires that uh, users of the software are free to uh, modify and share. Uh, any copies of the software, it wouldn't be possible. So uh, there are two approaches to the freedom of free software. One approach is to ensure that users always have uh, uh, the ability to modify the software. And the other is uh, that uh, uh, users are free to use the software in any way they see fit, even in ways that could potentially restrict their freedom. And the term open source isn't such, uh, uh, such a great choice either. Uh, the Open Source Foundation uh, uh, defined open source in, in the 90s as basically equivalent of what uh, Free Software Foundation defines as free software. But before that, uh, you could, uh, it was used uh, in uh, any case when some uh, source was involved. So basically you could say that uh, for some definition of the term, uh, the commercial Unix kernel was open source because you needed the sources under NDA, but you got them because uh, many of the uh, system parameters that you would uh, today uh, configure at runtime or at boot time via kernel parameters that are set uh, by editing constants in the source code and rebuilding the kernel. Oh yeah, and if you want uh, just, uh, if you want to know how powerful the PDP-11 computer was, uh, it was about uh, as powerful as today's Arduino, but it was a drop-sized computer. That's interesting that uh, at the time, multiple people worked uh, on something uh, that uh, uh, that uh, uh, we consider like a really small embedded system today. Yeah, and uh, the thing is that uh, uh, the open source, uh, the contribution of uh, uh, the BSD and uh, uh, Free Software Foundation is that they uh, showed that uh, software can be uh, released in a way uh, that uh, allows uh, sharing uh, uh, improvements among users. And if you remember the uh, uh, shareware and freeware ecosystem of tools uh, for Windows and DOS, uh, these tools uh, usually lasted for a year or a few and then were abandoned by the author. 
and you couldn't uh, fix uh, the problems with the software or use it on newer revision of the system because uh, uh, the source wasn't available, while many tools that were developed at the time uh, for Linux or BSD and were released uh, as free software uh, can be still used today uh, because uh, the, uh, the original author released them as open source and uh, uh, later, uh, if, if the software was still useful, uh, some other developers would fix it uh, to work with current day uh, ecosystem and uh, um, address problems and develop the software far further. It doesn't always work out uh, so well, though. Uh, 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 we have some experience with this uh, in SUSE uh, that uh, maintaining a modified version of a piece of a software uh, that is still under development uh, is, uh, is not exactly easy. And while it uh, uh, can be affordable for a company with tens or hundreds of developers, it's uh, tedious for uh, a single uh, user uh, to maintain a fork of their software that uh, includes their one bug fix or one feature uh, that upstream didn't accept, especially uh, in the face of security fixes, uh, uh, fast upstream development or, or large code bases. There is uh, another problem and that it's uh, 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 it, it's nice that uh, the original author releases the uh, uh, software as open source, but uh, if then somebody releases a modified version uh, without providing the source code, and the, the, the software was originally under GPL that uh, mandates that uh, the source code should be provided, uh, only the, or the original author um, can uh, go to court and litigate against uh, uh, the party that violated uh, the uh, license uh, the end users can't. So basically unless uh, the author is uh, able and willing to uh, litigate against copyright violators in uh, the relevant juris jurisdictions, uh, the license doesn't help all that much. And there are uh, other ways uh, that, uh, that uh, people found to defeat the, the, the GPL. Uh, one famous is Tivo, uh, which is a company that released, uh, that produced uh, 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 media players, which, uh, uh, which would uh, fulfill the GPL to the letter because the source code was available and you could build modified versions of the software, but uh, the, uh, the hardware uh, would only run system images that were signed by the manufacturer, so you could modify the software, but you couldn't use it. Uh, this uh, was addressed with GPL version 3, uh, which uh, wasn't all that successful. Uh, there is very little adoption of GPL version 3 outside of uh, uh, software that is uh, uh, developed directly by Free Software Foundation. And there is a problem that uh, GPL 3 is not compatible with GPL 2. And many, uh, 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 many developers that adopted GPL version 2 uh, didn't include the clause that uh, you can use later versions of GPL with the software. So now we have a lot of software which is uh, uh, released under different versions of GPL, which are mutually incompatible. And there are uh, other things that uh, might prevent you from uh, practically making use of the uh, of the 
uh, freedoms that the GPL provides. Like uh, we are using the RPN package manager, which is a nice open source uh, software to the letter of the GPL. You get the source code, you can modify it. But the purpose of uh, package manager is to manage packages. And uh, these packages are developed, uh, are created independently by packagers. Um, uh, and your package manager should work with this, otherwise it isn't much use. And the question is, what does it mean to work with these packages? Because there is no specification uh, of uh, the spec file syntax. There is no specification of what the dependencies means or other uh, other package uh, uh, description fields, what, uh, what they mean. Uh, it changes from RPM version to RPM version too. Uh, and uh, this makes working with RPM difficult. If you wanted to implement an extension, it's difficult to say if it will break existing functionality because you don't know what the existing functionality actually is. On the other hand, you have uh, other package managers like uh, the Debian one, uh, which have full specification uh, reference uh, of the uh, of the uh, uh, of all the dependencies and other metadata reference of the package format uh, and uh, this make uh, this makes for example possible to implement a parser of debian packages in uh, other language because you know what the format is Yeah, I should increase the size of my slide so that I see what I wanted to talk about. Oh yeah, MIDI. Uh, MIDI is uh, a, mu a musical uh, yeah, instrument digital interface. And that's, uh, that's an interesting standard because uh, uh, multiple manufacturers agreed on this standard and are making hardware that can be interconnected uh, even between different vendors and while there are uh, uh, open source implementations of uh, some of the MIDI tools it's not uh, crucial what uh, what makes the uh, what it's not crucial for the MIDI ecosystem the crucial part is that uh, multiple parties agree to work together to, make, uh, to create this standard that allows uh, anyone to participate in the ecosystem, create uh, uh, instruments or, or tools uh, that can be used with other instruments and tools uh, together. Uh, and uh, that increases uh, the possibilities for the users and it uh, creates opportunities for independent uh, manufacturers to uh, uh, create just that one tool that is missing in the ecosystem uh, without the need to replicate all the other tools that are already there. And some people argue that uh, as uh, software moves from isolated computers as, as it was uh, uh, with the uh, PDP-11 uh, to network computers and to uh, network computers and to uh, online services, it may be more important uh, important uh, to uh, create such standard uh, so that users can uh, use uh, multiple services from different providers together, uh, and that we require some standard that allows the, the users to move their data from one service provider to another seamlessly and to uh, and that uh, it is more important to have open standards uh, uh, for the uh, for moving uh, data than it is uh, uh, to have free software uh, running on the providers uh, uh, provider servers 
Uh, interestingly, there is also the argument that uh, security and uh, reliability uh, relies on free software because without the peer review that is uh, that uh, uh, is uh, possible with free software, uh, there is no way to verify the security and without the access to the source code, it is not possible to fix uh, security bugs in a timely manner. Well, that's not exactly true because we have a lot of open, completely open source software, which is huge, so it can't possibly be reviewed, audited, um, and ensured to be secure. And on the other hand, if we structured the software properly, uh, then mm, the security uh, critical uh, parts would be really small. And uh, so long as uh, these are designed in a way that uh, makes it possible to run other non-critical software uh, without compromising uh, the security critical parts, then this, uh, this other software can be anything. Okay, and are there some questions or some uh, uh, some uh, do you have some comments something? <laughs> 